All right, I've got Dr. Sean Dill and Lacey Book. They are the CEO of the specific chiropractic centers, and they also run the Black Diamond Club and are best-selling authors of the book I'm holding right here if you're watching on video, None of Your Business. Guys, welcome to the show. Oh, you've got it too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> got to have your props ready, right? You've got to have the gratuitous <laughs> plugs. Uh, this was an amazing book, by the way, but uh, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Um, always love chatting with you. You're an amazing, high-energy human being, and so super looking forward to our time together. Yeah, I uh, likewise. I mean, um, man, they say what, what's that phrase about energy? Um, like energy is currency, and I think there's that you know there's that exchange, and what you give, you get back, and you know you're, there's a there's definitely that attraction and that that harmony, and I I totally believe in that. So yeah, great to be uh, connected again. Um, you know, I wanted to get into some things about you guys. You guys are both originally chiropractors, but now you're teaching, and you and this book is about none of your business is about you know teaching service pro providers to be entrepreneurs i'm really curious like how how did that shift come about like was there a day that the both of you realized like as much as i love chiropractic like there's just so much more for me and so much more i want to do well i think just like yourself you know somebody that has a passion to change the world as a chiropractor both lacy and i um, we practice a very specific form of chiropractic called upper cervical specific and that type of chiropractic really sort of specializes if you will in sort of the sickest of the sick. It deals directly with the nervous system and it deals with the relationship between the top two bones in the neck and the brainstem. And so when you're in chiropractic college and you're coming out or you're just launching, you know, like in your case, you make this life shift and you're like, man, I'm gonna change the world. Well, that's how we felt going into practice. And for me, I was fortunate enough that I practiced in Costa Rica for the early part of my career. And I was seeing just tons and tons of people. I mean, I was mm -hmm. seeing about 200 and 250 patient visits per day. And I was working five and a half days a week. And I really thought, you know, in my 20s, that I was really making a huge difference, right? I was just making an impact. And I came to the United States um, on a trip and was with or amongst some chiropractic colleagues. And they were asking me, like, you know, what are you doing? And I, and, you know, I was telling them what was going on in Costa Rica, but I really realized that I really wasn't making much of a dent at all. And it sort of hit me that the world's greatest service providers, the, you know, it, it is so unfortunate, but the world's greatest healers, the world's greatest artists, they live in relative obscurity simply because they do not embrace the idea of being an entrepreneur or running a business. You know, it's all about getting your name out there. And so unfortunately, you know, I'm not knocking them. I don't know them personally, but we believe that Dr. Oz is the one of the greatest physicians. Why? Well, because he's on TV. <laughs> now, he may or may not be the world's most gifted healer, but I would venture to say that some of the best healers in the world, nobody knows who they are because they're in Omaha, Nebraska, or Tulsa, Oklahoma, in a little consult place helping people but the whole world doesn't know about them and they don't share their gifts because they really don't embrace this idea of being an entrepreneur. So we want to empower service providers to really make the impact that they were put on the planet to make by teaching them the skills of being an entrepreneur. I love that. I love that. And I, I, I mean, I can totally, yeah, like you said, I can totally resonate with that, that, that feeling of, and it's actually, and I don't, you feel like it's such a crime to, for these people, like these people actually exist out in the world, but just nobody knows about them. Like, I mean, that's got to drive you every day to know that. I, absolutely. And I think for us, like what we noticed, um, obviously we, we got started in chiropractic and we saw all of these chiropractors out there that really had great skill and they were getting amazing results, but they never were ever taught how to be a business owner. But that's not mm -hmm. just true to the chiropractic profession. That's so many different professions. There you go. Right. As a that's coach, so I many different I've got so many certifications. I never learned how to open up. I had to go through a separate sort of uh, coaching program to learn how to actually scale a business. So yeah. absolutely. It's like the one thing that they need to teach us in school and they never do. And that's what we realize. We realize, man, some of the concepts that we're teaching, they are good for anybody that is trying to make that impact that wants to get their skill, their results, and this amazing thing that they offer out there. And so many people are like you, they have to find it from somebody that they trust. They have to get a mentor. They have to get a coach. And we were just went on this journey where we were having success doing it in our own business. And then when we scaled our chiropractic offices, we were having success there people wanted to know more and here we are 
Amazing. So the in the book, None of Your Business, you know, the winning approach to turn service providers into entrepreneurs. Do you really think, uh, you know, obviously that's why you wrote the book, but do you do you think service providers should be entrepreneurs? Oh, they have to be. I, think, I, <laughs> I don't mean, think they have a choice. That's what I was going to say. I was like, I don't even know if it matters what we think. I don't think they have a choice. Well, you yeah. know, if they're not entrepreneurs, they have to be at least an intrapreneur, right? right? Where mm-hmm. they, um, you know, let maybe work for a hospital but still, you're bringing your skills that go beyond just clinical. You know, when you're working with anybody, with people, that's the service, right? We're basically selling ourselves. Communication is critical. Well, listen, communication is marketing. Like this right here, this conversation that we're having is marketing. And so if I don't understand that, then I could get lost in like, oh, we're just having this fascinating conversation. And frankly, it really wouldn't provide much value for your brand or your listeners. And so just knowing that this conversation is marketing conversations that we have you know outside of you know what's bothering you and how long has it been that way that's also marketing um service providers especially in healthcare we like to call it education and i think that's really bizarre because you know most people don't want to be educated and especially about something else right like most people when they're done with school they want to be done with school well yeah Yeah. i mean if i take my car into the mechanic i really don't want to be educated on how the catalytic converter works right i just need it to be fixed and so they have to understand that they have to understand entrepreneurship so that they're effectively communicating to me and i think really important is if they have a passion for this they need to arm me with the tools so that i can effectively communicate to other people so that i can spread the word for them Otherwise, again, now you're just going to be obscure. You're just going to be there all by yourself. Well, I also, I, you know, the other thing that's interesting is they have to know the difference, too, of between being a business owner and an entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. You're asking if people should be an entrepreneur. Yes, they need to be an entrepreneur because a lot of service providers, they're like, man, I want to go into business so I can be my own boss, mm-hmm. so I can have the flexibility and the freedom to live the life that I, that I want. But there's a big difference. You don't get the freedom and the life that you want unless you step into entrepreneurship. Otherwise, you're still working a nine to five job and you have more responsibility and more pressure and it doesn't serve you in the way that you thought it would. So you just you don't have, have to... some other guy that's your boss or gal that's yeah. your boss. Now it's just now you. Now it's just you and you have all the responsibility. The <laughs> right. Everything's the same. So unless you figure out how to move from I want to be my own boss to I truly want to be an entrepreneur, you're not going to get where you want to go by owning your own business. I love that. It's such a shift. People, like you said, they think they're going to get something by being their own boss, but they really just bring on more responsibility. Yeah. And they're essentially in a nine to five, which is what they really didn't want, but they don't see themselves out of it. I, oh, they get something. They get something. They get lots of responsibility. Well, well, they're not, and they're not in a nine to five. Yeah. Now they're in a nine to seven yes. or a nine to eight. And they're like, oh. how did this happen? And you're making less money because you're like, you have all these expenses. You're like, what happened? This is not the life that I signed up for. Because they signed up for being a business owner instead of an entrepreneur. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, so on that note, what do you think most service providers, like what is like the most common mistake? What are they, what are they making? Well, I think number one is they vilify this idea. That was, that's, you know, frankly, too, one of the reasons why we wrote the book is because people in the service world, because we have a service heart, mm-hmm. we want to go out and reach a lot of people and make a mega impact. But we, don't, we feel like that business, the marketing and sales part, that that's, that's taboo. That's bad. Um, and, and a lot of people say that. Like, I didn't, yeah. I didn't become a dentist to be <laughs> marketing and selling people on, on my, my stuff. And, and the, the consciousness is that I basically, the world should know that I'm so great. I basically should just open up my, my, my Put place. Put that little shingle up. And, and everybody should be like, up. wow, yeah. there's an acupuncturist. And they would just like make a line and I would just charge them. But that's not really how it works. And so the biggest mistake is vilifying these concepts. They're not mm. bad. They're not evil. In fact, they're tools that really help you to reach your life's purpose. Again, if you do want to reach a lot of people and make an even bigger impact, You're going to have to tell a lot of people about what it is that you do, and you're going to have to sell them. Otherwise, they'll just say, like, that's nice and interesting, but they're never going to engage, and you're not going to monetize a service. They're just going to say, like, that sounds kind of cool. Um, And listen, social media maybe is not our best friend in in that topic because there's tons of people that just put out really interesting information – and they might have a ton of followers and people think that it's really interesting. But, you know, just because you have a million followers, that doesn't mean a million people are giving you a dollar. If they would just give money. you a dollar, you'd be, a, you'd be rich, right? Yeah. 
I, you yeah. know what though? I, you know what else I think that they do? And I see a lot cause, and you're right. They vilify that. And then the next thing that they do is they have this misconception that they can't give a, give anything away. Like in their business. So they're like, I am going to be, I am, nobody can do my skill the way that I can. Mm, and so because of that, I'm not going to hire people on, I'm not going to teach them what I do. I can't delegate. And so the typical entrepreneur service provider, they have a tendency to hoard all of the responsibilities because they're scared to like offload them and give them away because they think that nobody will do it better. But there's no way to grow a business. There's no way to scale a business if you can't figure out how to release some of the things that you do, even though you do them really well. I love that because I know your background a little bit. Like you have studied with you know, masters. And I always tell people like, listen, if people say like nobody can do it like me. Right. From a business standpoint, I always tell people, well, what if we had two people that could do it 70% of you? Well, that would still be 140% of you. This is better than one of you. Like right. two 70% of yous is better than one 100% of you. And if you want to reach a lot of people and make a big impact, then you embrace that. You're like, it's okay. It's all right and that it, these people aren't me. And is it ever really 100% of you? Because like oh, you're true. doing so many things, you end up diluting the things that you're great at, right? Yeah. Like yeah. crazy. Okay. That's great. You guys now coming from the chiropractic background, I know you guys have a lot of chiropractors. Who else though, who else kind of do you, do you see that comes through your doors or that you see a lot of, or, and, and maybe that you can kind of talk about the black diamond club. And that's kind of what I'm referring to the mastermind that you guys have created to help solve this problem. Or if people aren't ready for that, go out and get the book, none of your business and at least just start with that. But yeah, who else, who else do you guys help? Well, we have a big passion right now um, for dentists um, a very similar thing. And, and dentists are fortunate because at least there's a consciousness about what mm -hmm. they do, right? Like nobody's like, ah, I don't need a dentist. I think everybody deep down knows that they need a dentist. But then we have the, you know, the situation of, you know, most people know it, but probably on average, most people aren't abiding by the every six month, you know, right. um, you know rule that they, they have established or, or recommendation. And a lot of people, even when they, you know, know that they need a dentist, they don't know who to pick. And so dentist is one that's very interesting, but honestly, um, it's everything that's providing a service. So inside Black Diamond Club, we have everything from like on the digital side. So if you're a digital marketer, well, that's a service. So you right. don't, there's nothing that you can touch. You're going to provide a service to me. Um, branding experts, people that I'm a health coach. Other people, I'm sorry, I mean, uh, health coaches. I'm a health coach, but that yep. would be a perfect fit too, right? Yeah, we have health coaches. We have life coaches, right? That's another like, and and these are things that wh whatever it is that you're selling, it involves you providing a service to another human and there's not something tangible in between in that transaction. So really we've come to specialize in all things that are in that box. And honestly, we're not that good at, you know, selling objects. Trinkets, like we don't, yeah. we don't, we don't do any consulting on people that are selling actual hard things um, because there's an exchange of the product. And so there's a whole other world there, you know, the manufacturer, the distribution, all of that, e whereas services, mm -hmm. I'm just providing you the thing that I've you know, studied my life, um, my, my lifetime to learn how to do that. But I actually think that there's nuance, there are nuances there that quite frankly can sometimes make it harder because after I, I coach with you, I don't have something like to show my wife and say like, wow, now look what I have. It, 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 it has to be, it's a reflection of my end, the consumer, how well I engaged you, that will determine the result that I get, which will then be what I will be able to show. Right. But that's still part of being an entrepreneur because if I sell you, you know, a pen and you just put it on the table and never use it, no big deal. You will always have the pen. But if you're selling me some sort of coaching and I don't do anything, it is a big deal because then I will feel like, well, I don't know what I paid for because nothing happened. Not, we didn't it's not do anything. working. Yeah. 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 You know, Sean, you said something to me really interesting on your podcast, and it really stuck with me. You said, have a conviction stronger than your desire. And I wanted to ask you, how'd you come up with that? And what does it mean to, to both of you, you and Sean, Sean and Lacey? Well, for me, that's sort of a, um, a signature story. And I'm going to add two words. It's have a conviction stronger than your desire to please. Um, and really, this came about from sort of a study um, and the same thing, it's about impact. And, and you know, I, I am very interested in impression versus impact. You know, we, we are taught commonly in business, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. 
First of all, that's not true. Right. Um, because there is a big difference between a first encounter and a first impression. Um, we have interacted, um, but depending on how I, as a human being, formulate my impressions, my impressions might be visual, they might be auditory. Since our interactions have taken place over the internet, I may not have even formed a first impression yet because I might need to be in, in a person. room with you in person. That's just maybe is how I'm built. But we've had a lot of interactions. So we've had first interactions, but the first impression can happen down the road. So in studying this, I was like, well, I want to be a person that makes impact and not just impression. And so I started to look at um, history. And it just came to me that history remembers and only remembers people who've had, an, an, had a conviction stronger than their desire to please. And I, I really started to drill down on the story of Rosa Parks. And you know, when you kind of dive into this, you know, this was during a civil rights movement. There were a lot of key figures in the movement. You know, we recognize them with holidays, Martin Luther King, and then you have Malcolm X, and people were getting together and, and really promoting this idea. And then Rosa, a simple seamstress, you know, she was a part of the movement per se, like she was a part of it, but she wasn't a figurehead. And one day she decides to go on this bus and sit in the front. But what's interesting about the story is that the bus driver looked at her when she sat down in the front and said, Rosa, what are you doing? The bus driver called her by name. So what that means is that Rosa had been on that bus many times before that. It was just that day. For some reason, something clicked in Rosa and she said, not today. Everything is going to change. And what I, what I realized right there is she had a conviction. She was going to sit in the front stronger than her desire to please because the desire to please said, follow the rules, go to the back. And she was like, listen, my conviction is stronger than that. And what we don't really stop and think about is that a simple seamstress did what these powerful figures in the civil rights movement were unable to do. She radically shifted the face of that civil rights movement right there. And so I draw that back and I, I when I'm you know talking to just everyday people, I believe that every person has a Rosa Parks moment in their life. I mean, you and your experience, you know, we're living in times where, you know, the police forces are under a lot of scrutiny. So maybe you're going along with something, but it takes somebody to say, stop, Like right? This is not good. And that, that thing, while it might seem small in the moment, it can literally revolutionize and change the way the entire world thinks about something. Yeah. I think far too often we place premature um, burden or responsibility on who we deem are the leaders, the politicians, the people on TV. And we don't realize that a simple seamstress like Rosa Parks has the capacity and ability to radically shift the history of the world. But if she would have gotten on that bus and gone to the back, we would not be talking about her mm -hmm. and nothing would have happened. Everything would have been the same. So for me, it's like, it doesn't matter who you are. You get presented these opportunities. And what also just really sort of tugs at my heart is, you know, when I'm saying this, every time I'm talking about this, I always wonder if there's somebody that's listening that's saying, I missed my moment. Mm. You know, I went to the back. And, you know, that's so heartbreaking to me. I, I want to empower people to be looking for that moment because you never know what it is. We're waiting for somebody to get on Oprah or to be on Dr. Oz or if they could just be on CNN or Fox News, everything would change. And the reality is that's not true. It just takes somebody to plant their feet with a conviction that's stronger than their desire to please. And that, frankly, can change the world. And listen, I know your personal story um, is very much rooted in that very same concept. Yeah, yeah. So it's so good. And that Rosa Parks story, it, it, it's probably, I don't know if you could find one better. Uh, I mean, it, and I love what you said. It, 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 I'm sure there's a lot of people that felt felt that they missed their boat. They, they felt like, man, I, I, I didn't stand up and I'm weak and I, and I should have done that. Or even worse, they're waiting for someone else to step up. And you can't. You've got to be that force. You can do it. And no matter how little or small you might think you are, look at Rosa Parks. I mean, she, was, she wasn't the Malcolm X. She wasn't the Mar She wasn't the figurehead of this movement. She became a figurehead at some point, but she wasn't in the beginning. So that's so amazing. For you guys, do you do you have a Rosa Parks moment for you? Do you is there is there a moment that sticks out for you that like where you look back now and you're like, holy cow, I didn't really think about it, but that was where I really pivoted. Oh, I don't I don't think that we've ever been asked that before. No, that's really good. Actually, I, it's a really good question. For, yeah, for me, I think that um, I don't know that I've had like a well, obviously I have oh. not had a change the history or course of humanity <laughs> moment yet. 
But what I, yet. what I, you've had to put it in your book your yet, my friend. Yeah. Y- yes. You, you have to, ch- I think on a personal level, you, you, you every day you have to just think like the decisions I make have to be rooted in my convictions and not just going where everyone else is going. And we live in a, in a world right now, again, social media makes that very difficult because it made it easy for sideliners to have opinions, to comment, to, you know, throw some shade on and throw some gas onto the fire. Um, but really what you have to do is navigate your life based off of your own personal convictions. And listen, whether that's spiritual, political, whether that's about your beliefs about health, um, I'd say in a lot of ways, like for us, you know, even coming on, this isn't hard because you are already in alignment philosophically, but, you know, being on other podcasts and, and doing media where you know that the, you know, the hosts, they're, they're, they're thinking like, listen, there's a pill, potion and lotion for everything that ails humankind. Right. And we're trying to tell them like, but we're not going to go along with that current. And we want to give hope to people that have come to a realization and understanding that, listen, I'm tired of, of just taking these pills because when I was prescribed the pills, there was no end point. You, you have high blood pressure. You're going to take the pills for the rest of your life. Well, that's not a solution. Never, it never fixes yeah. itself. But I think just having the conviction to stand for these things on, on all levels, you know, your relationships, your marriage, sometimes, you know, when you're, when you're in a relationship, people will say like, oh, let's just go do this or go do that, right? There's a micro opportunity for you to say like, no, you know, I, I'm committed to my wife. I'm married. I'm not doing those things. So your whole life is filled with these micro conviction moments. Um, and then, yeah, I, I, I'm eagerly awaiting. I work with um, um, a life coach of my own. He was just telling me today, he was like, you have no idea what's in store for you over the next two years. I was like, well, you know, I, the, the only thing I can do is just get ready for it. <laughs> and when the moment comes, I got to make sure that I don't just let it, I don't just let the bus pass me by because then no change will occur. Well, it's interesting because I'm listening to you talk and I'm thinking about like, did I ever have one of those moments? Did I let a bus pass me by? Well, what I would like to believe for everybody out there that wants to make an impact on the world and truly stands behind the service that they provide, that they've already had those moments and that they've rippled out through somebody else's life, right? So we're talking about changing the trajectory of the course of history, but maybe I have done that for somebody else and I don't know. And I would truly like to believe that a lot of the decisions that I have made up until this point um, and the conviction that I've had for chiropractic and what I provided as a human being and the guidance that I've given others, that somewhere in there, there was a moment where I changed the trajectory of someone else's life. And I think that every service provider on the planet, you know, they want to believe that too. If you can stand behind that, I mean, that I think empowers you and gives you exactly what you need to continue doing what you're doing, even in the hardest times, right? And it's super important for anybody that's like, I think my moment passed me by. Again, the point of that was that Rosa had gone on that bus and missed her moment. Many times. I have reason to believe that was the bus she took every day. Right. right? So every day she got on the bus and missed her moment and then missed her moment until something happened and it clicked in her and she was like, yeah, today everything changes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so even if you're like, maybe I missed my moment, that doesn't mean like there's not more moments. There's no more moments. Like you you get another shot at it. You're just going to have to dig in and be convicted. Yeah. So good. Yeah, I love the idea. There's just those micro convictions because if you're really in tune with your values, who you say you are, and you're connecting with those on the daily, then maybe sometimes it doesn't look like this big moment that like a Rosa Parks had. But if you're really connected with your values and you're just doing what you need to be doing and it just these micro small wins, that actually ends up over a lifetime to be huge amount of impact, which is what you guys are doing. So those micro convictions, I, lo- I love that. It's just really being connected with your goal. Your uh, I was just, yeah, I, I think what's really important for everybody listening out there too is the second part of that statement, stronger than your desire to please. We, we talk to people all the time that you know they dilute their dreams, they dilute their desires, they dilute what they're trying to do and, and the impact they're trying to make because of all of this outside judgment, right? So when we're talking about these micro convictions, I mean, even on a day-to-day basis, like there's no reason for you to dilute who you are and what you truly want and where you're trying to go because you're worried about the judgment of others. That desire to please, if you can release yourself of that, you have the freedom to go wherever you want, right? Mm. Yeah, so good. You know, in the book, uh, the book was written, I believe, in 2019, correct? So I'm reading the book, and you wrote, in the year 2023, it's this year, we are going to be in a we culture. Mm. 
how did you know that? Can you talk about can you talk about that and just that idea of you and, and you and you talk about the pendulum swinging and every twenty I think it was every twenty years the pendulum swings one way and it kind of comes back and uh, you had that prediction and I think you're right on the money. Well, this is actually um, uh, based off of a work in a book called Pendulum. Yeah. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating read. It looks historically at these, it's actually, so it's 20, 20 year swing to the bottom and a 20 year swing up. So the pendulum swings back and forth every 40 years between a me society and a we society. The peak of the last me society was 1983, right? And so you can look at cultural signs, music, Michael Jackson, Madonna, number one songs. They were very... Um, outlandish in their dress. The focus was on the individual, um, and even to the point where you know Madonna's number one song was "Material Girl." Right, we're living in a material world, and I'm a material girl. Well, now we're at the extreme polar opposite of that. We're we're now you know we live in a society where because of social media, you know we're interested in what everybody else is doing. If if there's a shooting in France then all of a sudden all these people start changing their profile picture in solidarity. Well, you didn't know anybody that was involved yeah. in this. You're not even in France, but you are kind of going mm -hmm. along with the flow. Um, this should be, in 2023, the peak of this collective idea. And then we begin a 20-year slide down to 2043, which was technically neutral. The pendulum comes down to neutral. And what's really interesting is around that time, we begin to see shifts again in, in um, the liter literary world, in the music, um, in politics. Um, understand that when we go back 20 years, so in 2003, give or take two or three years on either side of that, that is when all of these tech companies were born. Google, Facebook. So the emergence is signaled and then they ride that all the way. I mean, if you have this knowledge, you can be... Very, the, yeah. you, know, you can really cause a movement, but now we're going to start to move ever so slowly away from that beginning in 2024. Um, and so I do think that probably, I don't know, maybe in the next five years or so, we're going to see the breakdown of social media as people begin to leave those platforms and begin to start thinking about themselves. And also, you know, things like current, the current economic environment right now, those are things that cause you to think about yourself because in a recession or an economic downturn, Human nature isn't that, well, I'm just going to start giving money to my neighbors, right? So what happens is you start thinking like, well, I got to protect myself. Me, yeah. I have to be worried about my family and what we're doing. And so those are things that can drive us away from that. But listen, it doesn't matter in the service world. It's, it's, a, it's a shift in messaging from right now how we, how we market is this is what everybody's doing. In fact, you know, in, during COVID, that was kind of the messaging. Like you should get vaccinated because that's what everybody's doing. And so we market through the collective. In a me society, we shift the messaging to this is what's best for you, right? And so it's just understanding those subtle nuances that will allow us to reach the people because the societal collective mind begins that shift. And we can't be speaking, in essence, a totally different message. Right now, 2023, the peak of everybody wants to know what's in it for us way more than what's in it for me. So, so good. <laughs> Amazing. And going back to history, you talked about it. Hey, it's you you became a student of history and understanding these these swings, it can be very important, especially when you are a service provider or an entrepreneur and how you are going to direct your marketing. So uh, beautiful. I wanted to ask, you have a great part in the book. And uh, Lacey, you blew my mind in this part of this chapter of the book, talking about the money mindset. I think so many entrepreneurs and service providers, including myself, you know, coming from a nine to five kind of job, uh, having this idea of maybe scarcity or lack with money and, and really trying to manifest and create that, uh, that abundance. You guys have such a great chapter on that energy around money. Could you talk about, I mean, you, yeah, can you talk about how how do we how do we create a winning money mindset? How how long do we have left on the podcast? No, <laughs> I, no mean, I mean, Lacey, I gotta say, you went from the point where you started picking up pennies that had spit on it. So yeah. that's <laughs> the that's the like the pendulum swinging to the the to other end of the spectrum. Oh which blew my yeah, mind. so you yeah, gave away the punchline kinda... already. You gave away the punchline. <laughs> no, but this is, I mean, this is a really important part of you know our journey as entrepreneurs, as a couple, and and as business owners. Um, Sean and I were very very different when we first met when it came to our mindset around money. 
I think there's a lot of people when I tell my story that are out there that resonate with me where I grew up with not a lot of money. I mean, I started working at a very young age to get money to pay for things. I know a lot of people grew up in that environment where you counted every penny, right? And everything mattered. Everything that you spent your dollar on mattered. And also this idea that you work for an hour and you get paid that amount for the hour that you worked. It's like this equal exchange, right? I make $20 an hour and that's it. That's the limitation that you have and that's what forever that you can make because that's all you know. And so growing up, this is what I had experienced. I mean, I grew up thinking that there was limits around the ability to make money. And it's really interesting because the same way that Sean has actually studied, you know, history and culture, sales, marketing, I'm obsessed with studying um, money, how it works and how to shift mindsets. So first off, one of the things that I have found in my studies is that there is a difference between lack and scarcity. And this is really important. Because I, growing up, I, I use those words interchangeably. I would always say like, oh, I have a lack mentality. Oh, I have a scarcity mentality. Well, scarcity actually means that there's not enough in the world of it. It's scarce. It's hard to actually get. Lack means I do not have enough. I am actually ah. in default. And so it's really interesting. I think the first step in like, stepping into a winning mindset is first understanding truly what your mindset is. And so a lot of this comes from your upbringing. A lot of people think that money is scarce. Parents say things like money doesn't grow on trees, right? That's not necessarily necessarily saying we don't have enough. That's saying there's not even enough out there in the world for you to have more. And that's super powerful to identify that. And so what I realized is that Actually, my belief was that money was scarce, not just that I didn't have enough, right? And so I met Sean, and um, he would say things to me like, um, we, 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 we didn't have any money when we met, and we lived in a 625-square-foot apartment, and our kids slept on this hand-me-down green couch because we couldn't afford a mattress. Like, we didn't have any money. I'm like, now, th now we're in lack for sure. <laughs> but he would say things like, don't worry, the money will come. Like, what do you mean the money will come? Like, yeah, we have to work an hour to make the money. And he'd be like, don't worry. Like, we'll be able to make more money. And when money would come in, I wanted to like put it away and hoard it for that rainy day for that other shoe to drop. And he would be like, no, we have to spend it. We have to in reinvest it back in ourselves. We have to invest it in the business, invest it in education. Whatever we do, we take that money, we put it back in and it will come back. And I was like, this is the craziest thing I'd ever heard. Like, this is not so. But what I realized is that our limitation in our business and our relationship to actually attract a lot of money into our world and make a lot of money was because of my resistance to understanding it. And so I, this is my number one tip for everybody out there. Um, I read this book that drastically changed my life, and it's called The Little Money Bible by Stuart Wilde. And it is a teeny tiny book. And that's where I started learning about this concept that you just asked about, about money being energy and that money is truly energy in the same way that it flows out, it can flow back in. Right. And it's, it was a craziest thing. And if you're listening to me right now and you're like, that sounds insane. Good. That's step number one. If it sounds insane to you, that means that you have to do the work to understand it deeper. So read the book and the stuff that makes you uncomfortable reread that and dive in and begin to understand it. That's how you begin to shift your mindset to understanding how money works in the world and move from scarcity or lack into not just thinking abundantly, but actually instead of making money, attracting money. And there's a big difference. So good. And I love, I really do love the story about pennies because I was brought up with my mom always, and I, I live in a middle class Okay, I was growing up. I grew up in a. I wasn't like super poor or anything, but it was middle class. But I grew up with my mom saying like, "Oh, there's a penny, go grab it." So even as a 40 year old now, I see a penny. I'm like, "Oh, there's a penny." But then I think to my head, "Oh, I, I don't know if I should like. Does that cheapen me to go pick up a penny?" After reading your guys' chapter, I'm like, "No, this is exactly what you should be. Yeah, go pick it up because you're you're creating that energy of acceptance." And I I, I thought that was just brilliant. Um, and the the interesting thing about it too is, as entrepreneurs or service providers, when I 
a lot of the chiropractors that I've met uh, throughout my life, they seem to be very successful. They are doctors. They and I'm using quotes, not that they aren't doctors, but I'm just saying like when we think of doctors in society, we think very successful. And they seem to drive nice cars. They seem to be doing well. So it was just kind of odd for me that you guys had a chapter on money because I thought these people don't have money mindset issues, but apparently they, they do. They do I, a lot. And <laughs> I would say, like, I don't know. A lot, there's not a lot of people I know that have no money mindset issues, right? Ah. Even the best of us, if we are, think abundantly, man, that, that, those mindset issues can creep in. And they definitely have lots of issues. Yeah, and, you know, wow. one of the things that I – my, one of my favorite Brad Lee stories uh, from mm. Lightspeed, um, he talks about um, money being a tool. That just re really is, is a concept that super spoke to me. Um, it's like, you know, I, I don't have a lot of tools. Um, you know, I worked um, when I was young at uh, Sears in the craftsman tool department, in the, in the, in the tool department where you know, sell all kinds of tools and tool chests. Guys would come in and buy these giant tool chests. And then at Christmas, they'd get, you know, a new set of screwdrivers or a drill. Mm. And there's guys that just have a garage full of all these tools. But you see, the tools aren't doing anything. They're just sitting in your garage. And, you know, you have to understand a lot of people are just hoarding. Like Lacey was saying, I was hoarding money. But money is a tool. So if I don't take the tools and build something with it, there's actually no utility in them. It's just like a weird flex. Like, look at my tool chest and all the things I have. And there's a lot of people that manage their money in that way. They just have a lot of money. But if you don't leverage the money as a tool to get the money to do something, and look, in the service world, we're trying to change humanity. We're trying to cause a bigger impact. But if you're just grabbing money and putting it in a box or maybe worse, putting it in a bank and just holding it there in a 0 0.0004 interest rate on your checking account, you're not using the tools as they were meant to be used. You're not using the tools in service to humanity. And so I think that, yeah, a lot of people, maybe because of what we do, we get a lot of money. I think that the real um, sort of grade on how their money mindset is, is what they're doing with it. I work with a lot of clients and, and I, you know, they come to me and they have brilliant ideas that I'm like, man, this is really impactful. This could really change people's lives. But when I work with a client, I always tell them, I'm going to help you to be very, very successful with one condition. That once you are successful, you have to give some of that money back. Not all of it, but you have to give. We have to find the things that the reason why we're trying to create this financial abundance is to magnify the impact that we're able to have with it. You know, a lot of people, it's a very popular discussion too amongst people that are successful because other people begin to look at them and think that, well, if you are a chiropractor or a doctor or a dentist and you're making tons of money, well, you must be cheating, right? And so that's also something where there's a degree of shame that's, right. and that's a, that's a messed up money mindset. You know, in the Black Diamond Club, we celebrate success. If you made your first dollar, your first hundred dollars or your first million dollars, to us, it's the same. We get equally as excited for all of that. And what I love about the culture is everybody piles in and they're like, wow, you made your first hundred dollars. That's amazing. I remember when I made my first hundred dollars. And then other people might be like, well, I just crossed five million. And other people are like, wow, I can't wait until I'm there. Because what happens is when you're there, you're not able to just buy nice cars and nice houses. You're able to really give. You know, at the end of the day, you cannot give what you don't have. So the race is to have so that we can give. Um, if you're just having to collect, you're just putting a bunch of tools in the garage and we're not building anything. Well, and I hope, I, I hope that people heard that and caught that because that was a big learning lesson for me is that if your money is stagnant, so is your ability to generate wealth and create financial freedom period. So your money cannot be stagnant because so will you, right? And that that was really hard for me to overcome, but that's what Sean is talking about. And it's super powerful if you can figure out how to get your money to move. Mm, love it. Love it. A uh, couple more questions and, we'll, and then we'll, maybe if we have some time, I'll jump into some lightning round questions. This has been so good. Uh, there was a quote in the book that I wrote down that you, you talked about Jordan Belfort, the wolf of Wall Street. He said, should is the most disempowering word in the English language. How often do you hear that from some of the entrepreneurs that you work with and coach? Man, like it's <laughs> Every you know, what day? happens. Yeah. And so we're on the, <laughs> we're on the eve of meeting with our highest level of coaching clients. And, mm -hmm. 
you know, you go, every single one of us, right? You go to an event, you go to a mastermind or a workshop, or even you go to something where you're learning nuts and bolts type things. And like, how many things do we write down in a notebook? And then we just, we go home and we just, it, the next, you know, Monday, we should it's it over. away. And so, like, so many things we hear, maybe yeah. even on this podcast and people are like, oh, I, I should, should do, do that. that. And that is, that's why that's the most disempowering world because you're not taking control over your own destiny. Either you're going to do it or you're not. And listen, there's nothing wrong with listening to this podcast and saying, these two fools are dumb and I'm not doing anything they said. That's empowering, right? That is totally empowering. But also saying, I love that, you know, that point about this or that, and I'm going to apply that immediately. That's empowering. But, oh, I should do that. That's completely disempowering. The other part of that is in the service world. The reason why this is so important is because the world is trying. Disempowered people, they try to disempower empowered people because there's safety. And listen, you know, I know that you're going to be in line with this, but the media and social media, all of these things are disempowering us so that we're confused. We don't know what we should do. We, we're just like sitting around just, and now we're just victims of what everybody else is doing because we have no power over our own lives. And that's how forces win. You just disempower the person and get them to do whatever it is that you wanted them to do versus them being empowered, them making decisions based off of information, them doing what's best for themselves and their families in that particular moment. And in order to do that, you cannot be talking about things that we should do. Either we're doing it or we're not. I mean, sh like if you just think about the wor word should, it totally embodies a story behind it. I should, but you it should is always followed by, but I should do that. But there's not many people that are like, I should do that, but I am going to do it. Like you never hear that. Like it's, I should, but so when you say the word should, that means that you are already subconsciously creating a reason why you won't. That's why it's so disempowering. So good. I, I was just reading, uh, rereading a book that I got a lot of value called Nonviolent Communication and mm. just trying to be a better dad and communicate with my boys. And I noticed how many times I would say things like, man, I should have whatever, not reacted so much. And just for me, reprogramming myself, like you said, it's a subconscious thing. And I caught myself so many times trying to repair things with him and saying should, and I just stopped doing that immediately. So yeah, instead that. of I should have done that, or I should have not yes. reacted that way. You say next time I will. Right. And it just changes that programming. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 I want to wrap things up here in a bit, but I want to end your the final chapter of the book. You talk about your security detail in Costa Rica. What are some of the things you learned? What is like, or I should say, the big point that you learned from having a security force walk with you and guard you in Costa Rica? Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because I think like we even see on, um, you know, on TV, you watch, you know, security detail around celebrities, athletes, the president. Um, you know, you have this movie called Man on Fire with Denzel Washington. I actually love that movie. I tell Lacey, like, that movie is so real. Um, you know, people trying to protect your life. If you're in a third world country and you have any degree of wealth, um, you know, mostly it's your children who are um, targets. Mm -hmm. They're vulnerable and they could be grabbed and held for ransom. But also you would want to have security. And, but what's interesting is that I never contemplated that you have to be trained to receive protection. Um, and so like, if there was a threat, like the, the bodyguards know themselves what they're going to do. But if you are being guarded and you, you like, you know, wail and scream. Fall and or, yeah. so one of the, the biggest lesson that I learned is that we, they were training me and they were like, so if there is a threat, um, you know, they will yell out usually the gun, they'll say gun. And the, the bodyguard right next to you is going to literally grab you and tuck your head underneath them. So they're going to like shield you so now you're like curled up in a ball and then you're going to run as fast as you can, which you should try this. It's very hard to <laughs> run when you're like turtled up, right? And the bodyguard told me there's only one rule. And the rule is do not fall down. If you fall down, I fall down and we will be shot. And then I thought to myself, like, what a great life lesson and business lesson. There's only one rule. Don't fall down. There's going to be threats. There's going to be times when it's not going how you want but there's only one rule, don't fall down. If you lose your balance and you fall on the ground, well then there's nothing we could do. I mean, metaphorically, if we give up 
on a situation, then we're dead. Like th then it's over. But as long as I'm on my feet, as long as my feet are still moving, well, then I have a chance to get out of it. And so I think that, you know, for me was the biggest thing is, you know, this whole idea, I just remember them saying like, Sean, there's only one rule, don't fall down. And I was like, wow, that's a big rule. Cause there, I mean, in, in that case, it's yeah. literally, if you fall down, we're they're dead. going to shoot me yeah. and then they're going to shoot you. <laughs> so I was like, okay. <laughs> Pressure. I love that. Yeah, that, I thought that was so good. And it just reminded me, too, of just always showing up. Just get up another day. Just get up and just keep going. Keep doing it. And actually, by the way, as you were talking, though, I just thought also from a tactical perspective why you wouldn't do that, just with some of my background in training, is, you know, believe it or not, uh, going to – it's instinctual, actually. If bullets go – if you hear bullets, you actually instinctually want to get low and crouch. But it's actually the opposite – you need to push through and get out of that area. Mm -hmm. The other interesting thing is, believe it or not, one of the things that I learned in training was, and this actually, they, they learned, you can see this a lot in simunition drills where they shoot people with fake paint, uh, paint bullets, right? Is people instinctually will do that. When bullets go out, they, they go to the ground or they go to a knee. Well, guess what? People's shots, the bullets all go down low. So then you end up getting a headshot. So actually, you know, it's actually better that you don't. But it's such a great, what a great lesson, man. Amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you guys just a couple lightning round questions and we'll wrap things up. But before I do, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wish I had? No, this has been fantastic. Yeah, you actually have asked us lots of things that other people have I know that never we asked have never before, been asked. So I love that. That's awesome. Amazing. I love it. Um, all right. Let's jump into some quick lightning round questions. We'll get you guys out of here. I know you're on a tight schedule. I I'm curious for both of you. Just, you know, thinking back, like, are there any choices or maybe a choice that you think that you made in your life that, that made you who you are today? Mm. What do you got? You can go do yours first. I know you know. <laughs> right. I don't know. There's. Yeah. I mean, life is a series of choices, and so I mean, literally, the the actual answer would have to be all of them. Um, and I think there's <laughs> pivotal moments. Um, there was a moment in my life when I was in undergrad. I was in my twenties. I was having a blast at Indiana University. Um, I went to Indiana University to take my prereqs for chiropractic college, and after two years, I had checked off all the prereqs, and I decided to stay a third. Um, and my cousin, who was a chiropractor, um, he flew down from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to Bloomington, Indiana, and sat me down. He's like, what are you doing? And, and I realized in that moment, like, well, I, I wasn't really doing anything, but I was just you know, having fun. So I was like, I'm just you know, getting, doing pre-med. And he was like, like, figure out what you're doing with your life. Get into chiropractic college. I think that decision to, you know, I left univer Indiana University before I graduated to go to chiropractic college. Um, and I think that that was probably a very pivotal decision because if not, you know, and I always tell people, I mean, so the real reality of that um, question too, and I think there's a big answer there um, that I speak on a lot is imagine all of the weird things that had to happen for the three of us to be talking to each other. Right? Like it's, this is like total chance that, you know, so it's a series of decisions. Like what if you would have stayed on the police force then we wouldn't be having a conversation. You would be, in Oakland, right? So it's like, yeah. I mean, that's a pivotal decision that you made that affected me to allow us to have the conversation. So I think the whole world is a series of happen chance, apparently happen chance choices that we make that all line up just perfectly for us to be exactly where we are right now. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me too, it was the moment where I, I was actually working with a life coach myself and um, Sean and I were both working in our chiropractic office in Dublin, California. And I remember at one point she looked at me and she said, um, I want you to know that you are holding Sean back. And selfish, selfishly, like in any couple, in any relationship, when you're working together, you want to work together, right? And I wanted him to work with me. And I remember in that moment, um, instead of reacting and not taking it personally, I just went home and I looked at him and I said, you know, uh, Katya said something really crazy to me today. She said that I'm holding you back. And I kind of like, huh. And he looked at me and he told me I was. And then the next day I let him do what he does best, be the visionary and the strat like strategist for our business and me working on the operations. Um, but I was able in that moment to bet on us and release what was could have felt very personal um, to change the trajectory of what I feel like was the course of our lives and our business. And so I think sometimes in the hardest moments where fe things feel super deep and super personal, if you can just take a moment to stop and breathe and analyze and audit what that really means, those are the most powerful moments that make pivots in your life. Mm. 
He yeah. said rapid so good. fire. I apologize. We didn't, we didn't very really rapid fire that, did no, we? No, I was more rapid I, than I, you, By the I way, I, I, I've been talking. I always I call the, I call got these idea the lightning round from Tim Ferriss, but they're not lightning round answers. I should change this <laughs> section to the deep and profound question round, but I haven't figured out how to, how to reword that. So, no, the answers were perfect. Thank you. You know, you guys are such a force in the health and wellness world and in the entrepreneurial world, and you've already alluded to it, which I love, is that – Here's people at the top of their game, but guess what? They hire coaches. They hire mentors. They work with the best. Who inspires you? Well, for me, um, I work with two people currently. Um, David Meltzer, um, a business coach, and has – honestly, I mean, he works with so many people, but honestly has you know, become um, one of, if not um, our best friend. We have been so fortunate to do so many things with David and Julie Meltzer, and They've taught us so much about life and gratitude as well as business. Um, and then also um, I have a spiritual life coach, shout him out, Brian Hall. You can find him on Instagram. Um, Brian has just been pivotal for, um, you know, what happens is entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter what, it's not religion, it's your spirituality. And it's easy to kind of just find yourself in the, the, in the nuts and bolts of all of these things. But honestly, if you can take control of your, your spirituality, a lot of those things fall into place, your relationships, your business decisions, because you become um, aware that you're being guided by a higher power and you want to honor that versus, you know, allowing your ego to get in the way. And so Brian's been very um, instrumental and useful for me in that realm. And what about you? Yeah. And for me, like, I mean, I truly believe that you have to do self-work to create self-worth. And so I'm always working on my mindset and myself and all the, the things inside of me. And so I actually have my own life coach. I work with Stefan Lovegrove. Love him. America's he's, life coach. Uh, he's America's <laughs> life coach. He's fantastic. He's not yours. He's America's. He is on Instagram too. Um, but just fell in love with the work. And like, I do a lot of work with him on, again, creating more self-worth inside myself. Cause that's truly what, you know, like Sean is saying, even the spirituality side of it, the self-worth side of it. If you can get those things right, you can have whatever it is that you desire, right? And so that's really important to me. So true. Yeah. Last two questions. We'll wrap it up. Any any rituals or hacks or practices? You like speaking of like gratitude or doing a gratitude journal, like that could be one of them. I don't know. But yeah, any any rituals or practices you guys do on a daily basis? Well, I, I'm, I'm not a big believer in morning routine and uh, neither is Lacey. We are, and I think it's in a book, we talk, um, I think it's very important that Everybody gets so hung up and we do the, all these little rituals in the morning and then, I mean, by Go about 9 o'clock, and... like, they're, they're over. Yeah. We are very big on halftime adjustments. And I think midday, um, you, you start your day off and you have an idea of how you want it to go. And I think it's very important that you pause midway through and you course correct on every single day to make sure that you end how you want to end. Um, on the healthcare side, I mean, you and I could just talk for eight days. I, you know, I'm into peptides and IVs and cold plunges, and red light <laughs> therapy, and all of that. All stuff. things, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then yeah. for me, I think um, finding time for reflection, and then also finding time for execution. We talk a lot about that. I think you know, you go and you do this coursework, you go to a workshop, you go to a seminar, you listen to a podcast. And then you have no space or no time created or planned to execute or reflect on what you learn. So putting that in, like building that into our lives and into our world has been really impactful. That's so good. That's so true. Last but not least, Dr. Sean Dill and Dr. Lacey Book, where can people find you guys, connect with you, learn more about Black Diamond Club and uh, get your book? Yeah, so on all social media, I'm at D-R-S-H-A-W-N-D-I-L-L, at Dr. Sean Dill. Lacey's at Dr. Lacey book. Big shocker there. <laughs> um, so yeah, we love when people reach out to um, my email address is Sean at black club.com. If anybody um, listening is like, man, I, you know, if you want a copy of the book, happy to send you out a copy of the book. If there's anything that, you know, any resources that, that you want any from questions us. you have. And then also we have uh, prepared for your listeners um, a ton of gifts that we put together on a website at get hope today.com if you want to get hope just go to get hope today.com uh, we asked james our producer to stack up all of our best stuff and it literally is our best stuff and it's all free there's nothing to buy there's no upsells it's just you can go in there and access tons of of, of our content and it's all content that we have sold in the past um, so it's not like we just like threw some free thing up there these are these are courses that people paid for and that found extremely valuable and we're offering those absolutely free to all of your listeners today Wow. Amazing. Thank you so much, guys, for being on the show. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank we you appreciate so much. You. This was fantastic.